And I'm like, guys, I actually figured out why these, why the, all of these Japanese cards and products are going up in price. I, I think I've distilled it down to supply and demand. <laughs> I, I think the most money I've ever lost on a single card that I bought early on was a PSA 9 Evolution Stars card. <laughs> and then for the introduction, we could just basically say, hey, I'm Zach, and you'd be like, hey, I'm Greg. And then we'll be like, you're watching the Market Shuffle. So in this podcast, we're gonna be talking about the introduction to Pokemon in the Chinese market, as well as how that's impacting the Japanese market, all these crazy waifu numbers. We, we dive into everything Japanese. And of course, we talk about some sets that we love and we dive into some of our biggest mistakes as collectors and investors in the Pokemon hobby. Hello, beautiful people. Captain Zach Sperr here. I hope you're having a great day. I am with my friend. I'll throw it off to you, buddy. However you want to introduce yourself or if we cut this up, it's up to you now. Thanks, Zach. My name's Gray from Pokemon Buyers Club. Super excited to be here talking with you and talking about Pokemon. I am, I'm super excited. Uh, so, guys, I know you haven't been watching this, but this is more podcast style, so I'm just going to try to be a little laid back here, kind of loose, off-the-cuff stuff, and maybe Gray will edit this to what's presentable or maybe inappropriate. I don't know. Hopefully a little bit both. But I'm thinking a good like introduction for this would be kind of diving into what I think a lot of people have just been, I don't want to say ignoring, but a lot of people just simply don't think about because let's be honest, the majority of the hobby uh, would be like kind of impulse buys mm -hmm. from most, like they, you know, they see some fun stuff on the shelf at Walmart or wherever. Um, I always bring up Walmart just because I'm cheap and that's where I shop for, for a lot of stuff. Like uh, I think I got this shirt at Walmart actually. <laughs> But um, it's beautiful, I, stunning. Thank you. Yeah. It's it's nice and gray. It's like a little four pack. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, what did I do? I I went to Walmart and I saw these shirts and I was like, I just you know you instantly you see something sometimes you're like that was meant for my body and I was like I I need to have that in my life so that's what I did <laughs> um, and the rest is history really and I made it to the to the show I guess. Um, <laughs> Where I was going with that, though, would be um, the type of people who, like, watch this channel and watch will be watching your channel who are currently watching your stuff would be people who are obviously more engaged. So, like, for sure, I wanted to finally talk about um, maybe, I don't know, pull the curtain back, but um, about the introduction for Pokemon in China. There we go. We finally said it. We're talking about it. <clears throat> I feel like, and we were talking about this right before we started recording, or mm -hmm. I think you were recording already. Um, Stealth recording, I've captured it all. It's all, it's all making it in somehow. <laughs> I, I feel like it is so understated. It, like we, like you and I, even though we're aware of it, like we're truly not aware of what is yet to come, and that's a scary thing to think mm -hmm. about. And it's exciting, and, and all these other things. Uh, like for example. Um, obviously, the United States has already introduced Pokemon, so that's that's not a new experience. However, China is the largest market on the planet that you could introduce to Pokemon at this time. So now that they have been introduced, I feel like that's just massively understated and thought about even by people who are in the know and like to speculate and do market stuff. I, I, I feel like I'm uh, talking quite a bit here, just me, but um, I feel like that's a good place to kind of get things kicked off did you well, want to say anything first Greg? yeah i mean it is i think it's super interesting and i could say from personal experience when pokemon company announced that they were going to china first i was super confused because i thought there were chinese cards i didn't understand that it was sort of a hong kong market versus the rest of china uh, I also thought to myself that I just have no interest in those cards as a collector, just from a personal perspective. And I didn't think about it too much more than that. You know, I was like, okay, this is cool. They're bringing the cards to another market. More people can get them. I understand like, a lot of English collectors own, or a lot of English fans only collect English cards. It makes sense that if you were a Chinese fan, you would want Chinese cards. Um, and <clears throat> I think the 
what we're seeing now is the Chinese cards selling out everywhere and being absolutely crazy in those markets. And I think that just speaks to the success it's having in that market. And then I think we're starting to see that success trickle out into other markets in ways that aren't maybe obvious to a lot of people, uh, but help give an explanation for some of the craziness that is happening in, J in Japan specifically um, as sort of one of the many contributing factors to what is going on in that market. Despite that, again, I think a lot of people aren't really talking about it or aware of it. Like we're very sort of North American centric when we look at the Pokemon space, because I guess that's where we are and it's where it's the most obvious and apparent. Um, but things are going wild, man. It's crazy out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, like, yeah, I, I think that's a good point you bring up. I mean, it's really easy to just kind of like, for me personally, like I was introduced to the English product. So that's what makes sense totally. to me. That's what, I know most data points uh, and to be frank, what's available on the internet. Um, it's really easy to get the English side of things like the data for the, you know, booster boxes and previous products oh, yeah. and that it is a lot more difficult to understand history of the Japanese side of things. Uh, if you weren't just in it from the get go, which I would say the vast majority here are, are not at all. Totally. Um, it's, difficult to get that data so it's it's hard to remember sometimes that's where it's coming from i guess one thing that i i would want to point out that's interesting is on the so on the chinese side what's uh, i again it's another massive piece to this puzzle is the language so mm. from japan specifically why are some of these super old cards still pretty cheap even though they're pretty hard to grade True. or to move of them and uh, as always it, it comes down to demand and a lot of people simply don't know about these cards yet and i would say like the yet word um also the the language itself i know that's a massive barrier like i know some people again this is anecdotal but um i'm sure that this spreads to a certain degree which would be uh they don't like not being able to read what's on the card no sure. that's not just um i i i think the characters are cool i can't really read them but it i think it's cool however i'm trying to think here so you've got english that's spoken by like one and a half billion people um it, speak english where it's like their second second language and then you've got mandarin chinese and then mm -hmm. like, the third language is it's a distant third and that then that's hindi so i mean um you've got the one two punch now um which i think is massively understated and understood by us and um yeah i don't know uh, do you have any thoughts around that or maybe something else i think so i, I kind of get a laugh out of the the need to uh or the when people express that, like they want to be able to read the cards because as a, as a collector who learned to play the game recently, um, what I've realized is that before I knew how to play the game, I didn't read the English on the cards. And if I did, it didn't mean anything to me anyways. And I know a lot of people are like, Oh, I can't even read it. You can't read the Pokemon names. Believe me. I get that when I'm making videos, the Japanese cards, like I always have to be like constantly referencing like, wait, what is this Pokemon called again? There's tons of them. No one's going to know. Very few people. I shouldn't say no one. I know there's some superstars out there, but very few people are going to recognize every Pokemon on site every time. So that part is difficult. Uh, but there's a lot of detail to the card that people don't really, to the cards that people don't really get. So I just, I just chuckle at it. <laughs> it's like, I totally get it. I was the same. I became a sort of primarily Japanese collector over time, mainly because I got back into the hobby in a big way when you couldn't really get English cards very easily. And Japanese was a lot more plentiful. Um, and I grew to appreciate other aspects of the cards and started focusing mainly on it. Um, and one of the, the cool things is that you get to see the cards before they come out um, in English. And then because I'm always interested in what that means for gameplay, I do try to find translations and learn and understand what they do, which helps me kind of just understand what's coming and what's happening and things like that uh which is kind of cool but yeah you have no idea what's going on i have no idea what it is it makes sense it's the 
the language I think makes it a lot more accessible for people to get involved and excited about the hobby is really what it comes down to. So I, if I could only get Japanese cards, I don't know if I would have bought Japanese Pokemon cards in the first place, but English Pokemon cards, I'm a kid growing up, they're available. I got super into them. And then over time you learn more and you learn about some of the other markets and especially with Pokemon being a Japanese franchise, I think there is a bit of a draw to Japanese with time and with experience and exposure. Not necessary, uh, and it's not for everyone, but that definitely can happen. And I think that's when we add new, entire new populations to the hobby, that can happen. You know, you get you buy your Japanese packs, you, or sorry, you buy your Chinese packs, you love them, and then you start learning about like the cards in Japan that are a lot different. I guess the Chinese cards started in Sun and Moon, so they're they're kind of like playing catch up. So they're going like many many sets ahead with they look at Japanese cards, um, and they're still like pursuing some of the modern options and things like that. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> that's I find that interesting, and then I also find it interesting like looking at. I know we've been I, I've been talking about this a little bit um, on the channel, which is. Um, like the pop counts and i don't always like mm. referencing that because i know it's just like one piece to the puzzle um but i do feel like it's in let me know your thoughts here i'd be, I'd be interested to hear that which would be I, I feel like it's it's sorely misunderstood right now like exactly right now um like for example we, we keep talking about so like uh moonbrion on the english side uh you're looking at i just checked earlier today seven thousand and two PSA 10s out of a pool of 9,060 that were graded at PSA. So you're talking about a 77% gem mint chance, which I think is insane. Wild. Um, so 7,000 7, cards there. On the Japanese side, you've got 3,336 mm. PSA 10s out of a pool of 3,700, which is an over a 90% chance that that card is going to gem mint yeah uh i i find that beyond insane and what what do you think though ah uh, so one it is kind of insane there's definitely a selection bias where people are probably sending in the better examples but mm -hmm. so that's going to skew them a little bit more i feel like my experience opening evolving skies at least makes me surprised that that would be the percentage of psa 10s like, I feel like all the packs I opened, like, cards were always, like, off-center, always had all kinds of issues. I never pulled any of the top bangers. I never got anywhere close. I think I did I did pull the um, the Batman Neuvern illustrated by uh, Mitsuhiro Arita. I don't know if you know that card. It's the one where it's, like, in the city, falling through the sky. I did pull that. And it was, so it's actually a pretty okay example. Uh, but I'm not sure it would get a 10. I'm also not really – I've never graded a card myself. I'm not a grader. That's not like my background. So my sense of like pre-grading and how they should shake out is is pretty underdeveloped. Um, but there is – people have always said that Japanese like quality control and consistency is a lot higher. For a long time, Japanese cards were known to grade a lot better than their English counterparts. Um, and I think at EV Heroes was – from what I can tell – kind of when um, Japanese production started to like slump a bit just because they started to really crank up the print runs. It was such a popular set. Um, but I think leading into that, they were still pretty high standards out of the Japanese sets. And I, I've heard some people say that they think they've dropped a little bit since then. But I think it's still still pretty high compared to what I remember getting in like Shining Fates, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I guess... <laughs> on the yeah as far as like gradeability goes and just uh, how easy they are even though that sounds like you were on the below average side as far as like how, how good your cards were dude i swear during that that hype peak bubble when pokemon company had like crank i mean they still have crank print runs but when they first really cranked it up i swear i, I couldn't pull anything that wasn't anything good i pulled always had issues like visible noticeable you know issues on on opening like i said the worst luck man it was part of why i gravitated yeah. to japanese without realizing it <laughs> just like opening cards that don't feel like they're psa sevens out of the pack you know yeah no i get that and like dude let's be honest the the cards are cooler like you don't you wouldn't think they would be but the the subtle differences the 
um the artwork itself like the the way that you know when you hold it in the light like only people who handle japanese cards know what i'm talking about yeah you know, poor job uh, articulating it but um yeah it's just opening you if you haven't you should open up japanese at some point it's just it's such a cool experience it really is it is now granted right now it's it's fucking oh do we swear on this podcast i don't know I guess we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's so hard to get Japanese sets at reasonable prices right now. It's kind of it does kind of complicate things for sure. Um but yeah. I do want to take it back to the pop counts because I think one of the things that's hard to wrap your head around and that I don't have a great model for thinking about is like what those pop counts even mean from the context of that that card's long-term value and collectability because by Pokemon standards, those numbers, thousands of PSA 10 examples, especially when the majority of all graded examples are PSA 10s, it's like not a good marker for the long-term collectability or value because it just makes it so vulnerable to the hype swings, right? Um, but we're also just in a different time. Like, I, I don't know. I... I I'm not an expert in this space when it comes to like pop counts, grading, graded cards, et cetera. But you just look at like sports cards and they've got like pop counts like that all over the place and values that are just through the roof. Right. And so it's unclear how you line those up. Like, yes, the populations are crazy compared to what we're used to. There's a strong argument too, with some of the values that these modern cards and super high populations are getting that many cards with considerably less populations, especially in the tens are substantially undervalued, but it's also where the demand is, right? Like they're just, these modern cards are beautiful. I'm not, I don't blame people for chasing them, but you wonder like over time, does that excitement for those specific cards stay? Does it kind of dissipate over time as new fancy cards come out or as people educate themselves more and find reasons to care about the rarer cards or rarer by condition rarity, at least, um super unclear right yeah no I, I i love that you bring that up um this is what's great about a podcast form where we're just talking back and forth um and i feel like i feel to, to bring up in my videos uh which would be the the exact sentiment that you just shared there which is what does that look like um and the demand side is so weird like what what is demand exactly like mm -hmm. is some of it speculative driven demand i think so but is a lot of it like genuine hey i really want this i want to open it i want it on my shelf or whatever i'm sure there's a large portion of that too um do i think there are cards undervalued underappreciated or just flat out people aren't aware of them yet especially the older back you go totally how how much this is the question how much of an opportunity is there right now here and and this is what i just recorded a previous video on which i don't know if it'll be out before or after this doesn't matter but which would be how much of an opportunity is there and i think we're going to see a massive opportunity because of what we're talking about right now which is the introduction of pokemon for china specifically and then you're now you're seeing on the japanese sites even more specifically Kind of, they're experiencing their sort of 2020 boom right now, which is interesting. So it's kind of like living in an alternate universe right now, which is fun because I'm seeing it all over again just a couple years later. Um, but as far as, hey, uh, you know, there are thousands of these modern day cards graded, like in the grand scheme of things, I totally agree. That's not enough to move the needle as far as um, keeping the price uh, down. Right. So, I mean, yeah. you, if, you, if you just have swarms of people who want this Moonbrew on, absolutely. I can see that stalking. Here's the interesting point that I want to bring up right now. The market cap for that particular card, there are there's literally less than two handfuls of cards out there right now that have a higher market cap than this Moonbrew on card. Mm -hmm. And that to me doesn't feel right since it's so new and for exactly the reasons that you brought up, which is is this set going to be forgotten, uh, you know, in, in the future? Like Roaring Skies, I feel like is a decent example. That was a super hot set. Mm. Um, and like, I'm not super jazzed to go back and revisit it. Maybe it's because I also know it's expensive, but yeah. maybe that's a bad example. But like, I don't know. Do I want to go back and revisit Platinum? Like, I, 
not really. So I don't know. What's your take? I don't know, man. I I feel very similarly. Like the, I, I do not have a good track record in investing in specific cards. And I, part of that I think is timeline. I've only been buying Pokemon cards and products again for the last some, somewhere between two and three years or so that I've been kind of actively engaged in the hobby. Um, which also means that when I've started buying things that they tended to be in their hype peak bubbles. Um, but I find cards difficult. Um, and when you look at a super hype card, a super hype modern card, I totally get the skepticism and the resistance and like the outcries of saying, this is ridiculous. Like this price makes no sense. Like everyone buying these, like eventually things are going to crash. There will be issues, whatever. I get it. Like I totally get it because there's so many of them. And so even though there's obviously with the prices, not enough to go around, um, there's still just tons. So, I mean, if the market, if if half the people leave the hobby, what does that do to that card? I don't know. Um, and it's always so hard to tell like where we sit in terms of bubble or like long-term sustainable demand and attention. Uh, yeah. And when the demand is growing and generally in a positive state, it, it always feels like it's a bubble. And I'd say right now, every with everything I've seen the last couple of years, it feels like we're in a pretty good, stable state in North America. And it feels like Japan is in like a hype bubble that looks a lot like late 2020 in English at the moment. Yeah. But who knows? I don't know. This is going to be how our conversations always go. Is just me going. I have no idea. This is not. I'm not an expert in this. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, no. That's that's why it's great and why I'm super excited that we're talking together. Is uh, I don't know. No one knows, right? <laughs> um, like I truly don't. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Here's the. Here's what's interesting. Do I think with with again? I, I don't have a better way to phrase it. Uh, with introducing pokemon in with into the chinese market mm -hmm. um, it, is this new wave new spike of demand is this just sort of the beginning or maybe the new norm quite possibly right um we we have to uh there's no way we'll know until like five ten years from now at least right and then and then we'll have our answer um what i do know is right now things are volatile and that is what makes me like kind of pump the brakes as an investor um, for the more speculative assets, which would be like the graded cards, uh, yeah. because I, just, I have no idea like what you said. Um, but I think your know, graded cards, you know, when I when I was getting into the hobby, it was, um, you know, Rudy from Alpha Investments, who was like, I don't trust these Pokemon card things. But the sealed is like, I like the sealed. <laughs> And he's obviously he's a big sealed guy. Um, the sealed makes so much sense. The graded is tricky, man. Like every every pack that gets opened just adds more cards into the population. Like I do think there's an element with cards where they get opened, but they disappear into people's binders and they like never see the light of day. You know, they never hit the pop report. Like people pull them like, oh, it's amazing. It goes in the binder and then it stays there forever. Like they kind of disappear and then it takes really dramatic price movements like in 2020 with like unlimited base set when people start pulling their binders out and actively selling but it kind of for a lot of people they just they they might forget about them and move on they're like they're collectors they love them they keep them forever um or they move on but the card just stays in their closet somewhere but you just never really uh you just never really know what's gonna happen so i think a lot of people like when they're picking cards i always feel like when people talk about cards, they love to focus on the metrics of like, you know, older, rare, mint or better, the SM Pratisms, the things that could make the card desirable, but they're always looking for the ones that no one really cares about. Like they're under the radar and then they're just gambling on the attention, suddenly focusing on it. And then those other underlying qualities, giving it an opportunity to like spike up when people are talking about it. But even that seems, I don't know, even to me, I'm just not, I'm not like a card investor. I, I, I like the cards. I buy the ones I like, I collect them. Uh, maybe one day I'll, I'll sell some cards if they go up and I don't really care about them as much anymore, but I, uh, I don't know how to play that game, you know? Yeah. 
I I don't either, man. If you figured it out, you know. Um, Dude, I bought so many amazing rares when they were like still pretty expensive. Oh, just oh, got yeah. slaughtered. That's awesome. Good for you. <laughs> when you remember, like amazing rares, Vivid Voltage came out. Amazing rares were like fifty dollars a card, and they just seemed yeah. crazy. And I was like, I love. I think the I love the amazing rares. I think they're super cool cards. So then, when they got down to like. 10 15 dollars a pop i was like it's a steal i'm going in and i was like i just bought like multiple binder pages of each card yeah. and now they sell for like a couple bucks <laughs> it's like it's so funny that's awesome. <laughs> yeah that's there's so a lot funny. <laughs> oh hey you never know right time is funny man how it changes things yeah over enough time you know another five ten years maybe they'll be actually worth quite a bit they are very cool cards i still think there's a lot of good qualities of those cards. I really, I love them. That's why I bought them. I was like, these are, these yeah. are dope. They, they kind of give very old school vintage vibes, but with a real nice modern twist. So yeah, I still love them. No, I love them. I wonder if uh, maybe, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't hear much about it. I wonder if like they just stopped it due to, uh, did they see like different weird, like, uh, did they have internal data that we weren't aware of? Maybe they were particularly hard to print consistently. I'm not sure. I also don't know. I thought they were a great like rarity format. Um, mm -hmm. I would be really happy if they came back. Uh, like alternatively, then you know they came up with the radiant cards that were sort of like a new type of amazing rare esque card. Um. And those are cool. I, I really like them, especially the Japanese ones that really, really look pretty exceptional when you hold them in your hands. Um, but I would take new Amazing Rares over the Radiant cards any day. Like, I I just thought they were cooler, personally. But I will yeah. say they did stop at nine, which is like a perfect binder page, which is really cool. You know, you get all nine laid out on a binder page. And, and you, I did, like, you know, my English and Japanese ones on opposing pages. So I could, like, open it, and it's just a binder double page of amazing rares and it's it's awesome i love it it looks so cool so i kind of glad that they stopped at nine for that reason but if i, I would have continued it I, I don't know i thought they were a really cool cool type of card yeah no i like them yeah they're, i i picked up quite a few too i i um i still got burn on mine too because that's dead money for me right now yeah uh, which is unfortunate. but that's part of playing the game so whatever um yeah. I, uh, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, some, something came to mind when you were talking about the amazing rares. So I was just thinking about the different artwork. And then I got to thinking about uh, different like investments that I made over time. And then I got to thinking about specifically, uh, well, shoot, what's the name of it? It's Rayquaza C level X. That one's a lot older too mm -hmm. um, from the mm -hmm. platinum. Drama. But um, that card, I don't know why I have it memorized last i looked it was four it had a pop count of 49 uh for in the psa 10 um and i remember that card is going for substantially less money than yeah. it's getting out on the market today so it's what i'm trying to i guess say here is i know that card's hard to grade i know no one knows about it um it's rayquaza though um so my thinking is like man are people going to want to visit like a 7000 pop count umbreon again to kind of jump back to that and like i don't know does that mean that the rayquaza c level x is a really good play right now i definitely think so but i don't know like by how much so and like for example the umbreon could totally stay in a super high market cap relative to the market it totally could do that forever and we could also see prices uh, rise over time because we see more money flood the market, more people from China get involved, more people from Japan, US, whatever the case, more money keeps coming into the hobby. I know people keep asking, where's all this money coming from? I'm like, dude, you just opened up like a third of the planet. That's where it's coming <laughs> from. But uh, I think it's what, what's what's interesting is um, I'm, I guess I'm not convinced of, like, just again, I don't, I don't mean to pick on Umbreon. It just happens to be a super popular card. Dude, I just everyone talks about Umbreon. You can't help it. It's like, it is the poster child of the modern hype and boom. <laughs> it definitely is. Um, yeah, them and the white foods. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a different podcast, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know. Does that, does that, uh, 
how does that resonate with you? What what do you think of when you think of anything related to older cards or modern cards or maybe you don't want to talk about this anymore? No, it's it's super interesting um, because <clears throat> there is fewer numbers, harder to grade, like condition rarity matters a lot more with most older cards. Uh, they're harder to come by. Like you can't always just go out and buy the older card you're looking for. Like you're just finding a seller for some of these cards is actually really difficult. Um, so there's a lot of really strong qualities of them. So they're kind of just an interesting expression of of the demand. Like it, it's so uh, it's so easy to focus attention on the new, and I think people tend to. Um, but there's so much, there's so many amazing things in the history of the hobby, but you really have to do work to find them. And the question is always like, will, will people do the work? Will these things resurface? Like, will they come up? So like the Rayquaza, I'm actually not familiar with the card Rayquaza C level X. Um, but it's like, I, I feel like when you look at modern prices, it's really easy to look at most older cards, uh, that would have been chase cards in their time. And they just look like completely undervalued. And, there is a very real possibility that it's just an over concentration of demand in the most obvious chase cards and the most desirable and obvious chase cards in the modern hobby. And, but I, I don't know if that necessarily means that that demand ever trickles down to those older cards. You know, like I, I think that they kind of just, I don't think they lose a lot of value. I think it's like a hobby stays strong. Like they'll probably still do well. They'll probably go up over time, but I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Like what, what have we seen? I feel like the uh, like the original EX cards have kind of had a bit of a boom in the last couple of months, or so I hear. Uh, and they're really cool cards, but I gather for years and years and years, like they were pretty cheap and pretty readily available, and like no one really cared about them. And then suddenly people started caring about them, and then more people started caring about them, and it kind of like snowballs. Um, but like that's not guaranteed for every like old card, you know? Like, yeah, I I think I agree. I think I understand what you're saying. <laughs> um, it, it's yes because in a, a decade from now uh mm. you know uh, we have to presume that we'll have 10 more years of pokemon sets that come out multiple times a year between now and then on top of all of the older sets that we have now that people aren't mm -hmm. uh, objectively or not looking at investing in or interested in currently will it assuming the more people gradually get introduced into the hobby over the next decade, uh, which I believe would happen. Um, but even assuming that, how much of those people will trickle down to these older, more niche sets? I don't know. Um, but here's the in interesting piece would be, man, there's so many ways you can look at this. One thing would be like uh, for that Rayquaza in particular, how many people like Rayquaza? A ton of people like Ray Rayquaza. So, I mean, it's a popular Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Do or, like, low pop count. Uh, maybe they want to, you know, complete a level X set. Maybe they want to have every Rayquaza that's out there. I don't know. Um, do I think there are more than 49 people out there that want that card? Probably. Yeah. Uh, I would assume at some point. So, but um, how much will that price move up because of that. I think it's a great play right now for the long term. Short term, I don't think it's sexy, to be honest. But that's why it is really interesting to me as an yeah. investor, which is, hey, is this something that I could comfortably park, like a, a decent chunk of money toward, like, you know, buy a handful of these cards, and I kind of, you know, uh, capture a corner of that particular market? Yeah. I think that's an interesting play for the long term. But, yeah, short well, to midterm, um, vintage is kind of, like not sexy <laughs> so, yeah yeah it kind of is it's such like an unpopular thing to say this is where we're gonna get all the thumbs downs is talking about vintage being unsexy <laughs> well like so for example i i like thinking about it and i know hard shop owners <laughs> they they look at it a lot like this which is like just turn and burn i get the yeah. new set Turn it. I have to get that money back. I recoup that money so I can, you know, plow it into the up next upcoming whatever, uh, which makes sense for me. What I like looking at is modern specifically. Why I really like investing, especially in sealed modern, but uh, yeah, especially sealed modern because uh, I, I do not like speculating on modern cards. Uh, I mean, 
it takes you more than what two minutes being in this hobby to understand you know, yeah man tanking with people. we're uh, we're the same on not speculating on modern cards but i it's most because i tried it and failed oh well, yeah absolutely <laughs> i feel like most people when they enter the hobby they get burned by something like that yeah. so that's that's fine but yeah like uh what was it oh yeah on the 151 video i uploaded earlier which is just i i don't see that set not performing well even if they print way too much of that set uh, maybe it won't perform in the short term which would kind of defeat the purpose of me investing in water but i just i don't see that set sitting stagnant for the next decade and i, yeah. I look at a decade or less like is a relatively short ish play um, which is why modern is super fascinating and super fun for me to speculate on. I'm not going to lie. Here you go. Hot take for me. I would Let's be shocked if I, don't, if I don't quadruple my money from all set in the next decade. I would be, I would be just, uh, in 151. Long yeah. Yeah. That would be like poor performance for a Japanese special set substantially. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like based yeah. on historical, what we've seen. And being such a, like a hype set, so much nostalgia. It's exciting to new and old collectors because all the the, the boomers like us want our base set Pokemon, um, and the new collectors get incredible art and like some amazing qualities of of that set. Um, so I, I agree. I I totally take that set long term for sure. I think what's tricky is that buying into that set right now, you're already looking at like three to four times msrp which is the scary part right i'd be surprised if the japanese business ever produces enough cards to actually put a substantial dent in that though like ev heroes was the same you couldn't buy ev heroes for really anything less than like 3x what it should be like if it's like a 40 dollar booster box and i'm speaking i'm doing my best to think in usds because i'm sitting here in canada but if I'm thinking a forty dollar USD booster box, and then I can't buy it for less than like one twenty USD, like that, that's kind of scary. But EV Heroes has gone bonkers because it's an amazing set, and their ultimate was just never enough made to get it down to a reasonable price. I think one fifty one will be on the same trajectory. Would be my guess. It's it's it does kind of come back down to just like supply and demand, and there's a whole new market now in the hobby. They're, they seem to be excited about it, and we kind of see those effects across the hobby, which is kind of interesting. And bring it back to the opening conversation, not not talked about a ton, but I think like people understand the effect that the demand has. It's just always like, where is the the future demand going to actually come from? We've seen a little bit of that, you know. <laughs> I was laughing because I was just thinking, I want to make a video, and it would be like five seconds long, and I'm like. Guys, I actually figured out why these, why the all of these Japanese cards and products are going up in price. Like that's the title. The you reading the title would take longer than the video would be to watch it. And I would just like sit down, and I'm like, it would be like, I, I think I've distilled it down to supply and demand <laughs> and that, <laughs> and that, like, you said it. that somewhere recently you said that in a video didn't you you're like i was trying to break down like all the different models yeah. for what goes into some of these market movements and like when i just boiled it down it's supply and demand it all just comes down to supply and demand and everyone just it's, like, wow. it's, <laughs> it's so true though it's so true because like me and my little brain, like, I was trying to think of cool, like, Zachism I could come yeah. up with. And I was like, right. So you got the popularity of it. How much do people want it? The hype. And I was like, all right, so that, what if I boil all of these things down, it's like, okay, that would be on the supply, or that would be the demand side. And it's like, okay. And then, like, but we have to think of, like, we have to consider pop count. We have to consider how much product is actually out there. And I was trying to think of all these different angles. I was like, hey, wait, it's just supply. <laughs> so, like, I was like, maybe I should just call it supply and demand and like just slap my, my name next to that. Like, <laughs> It's true, though, you know. I think the question, the tricky part when we look at supply and demand is like, what is the premium you place on, on increasingly restricted supply, you know? 
Yeah. So I'm I'm going back to like our pop counts conversation. If we say seven thousand PSA ten English Umbreons is a huge population, it's like okay, that makes sense. And there's a huge amount of demand. So there's some sort of relationship there. But then it's like if we half that population, like what is what is the appropriate pricing? Like what pricing makes sense with half the population? Is it half the price? Like there, there's some there's some factors there, you know? And then when you look at something like a Illustrator Pikachu with however many graded copies there are, 40 something or whatever it is, it's like, is that worth a million dollars then? Like, is that the right premium on a supply of 40 and then you're like, well, what about that Rayquaza man? It's, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you bring up a great point, which is, I mean, uh, more people are aware of and or want, um, you know, of really, you know, there, there are similar pop count items out there all over the place. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, people are going to want what they're going to want. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't have any data on how to gauge when someone is going to like something, right? Uh, something that's subjective. But um, I think the math definitely helps. It's just a piece to the puzzle, though. And I feel like mm -hmm. um, that's why I spoke about it at some point. And I was like, pop counts overrated, which it is to some degree. Like, it can totally help, like, bring you back into reality in the sense of, okay, if there are 20,000 uh, what is it? The Grand Prix illustration chart. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm like, if there are 20,000 of those, I was like, all right, so I'm going to have to cut my losses there. <laughs> Moving on. But yeah. like, it's uh, seriously, I think that one to 10,000 PSA 10 currently with the demand we have historically seen. And I'm just talking about the last couple of years, that one to 10,000 PSA 10 pop count mark um, is a pretty large number. But like what you said, if people kind of sort of wake up or they're aware of all these numbers, like goodness, like, you know, how many Logan Pauls will it take to just wipe out the market? Not many. You know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, I don't know. That was a long explanation of me saying I have no idea. <laughs> nice. We're both yeah. we're both the same. We have no idea what we're talking about. And that's why you should listen to us. <laughs> Hey, that's our intro. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, killing it. Pod one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been recording for about 50 minutes, it looks like. Okay. I've um, been recording for 45. Okay. So. so 45 is the more realistic length of like content that we have. Um, yep. We can keep going. I, I could definitely keep talking. We could, um, I, I think, I feel like the conversation has shifted more to just the general idea of supply and demand being like the theme that has emerged to me is that supply and demand is relatively simple and easy to understand, but ultimately kind of just drives everything and is sort of understated how important it is considering how simple it is. Cause everyone knows it, but then we we scrutinize all these other things you know and it's all over the place and it's like when you get down to the core of it it's kind of just all it is it's like you yeah. can't you can't ignore it there's it's just that's just it is like the the underlying key variable it's the the sure. official market shuffle stance on market movements supply and demand trademarked lock it in <laughs> yeah uh no i agree with that um <clears throat> I was just thinking about like, uh, I forget whose video I was watching. So I apologize to that creator, but they were talking about, I think also, uh, the Mario Pikachu cards mm. or even the Tonto Pikachu cards. I've heard that brought up from a couple of times lately as well. Um, like those are a bit older now, but it still goes to show like those are popular cards. So the mm. demand is there and there are quite a few numbers of, all those cards like in the lower thousands, but like you're looking at like, if you want to pull that up for us, even uh, I believe off the top of my head, like the Mario Pikachu card, I want to say there's over a thousand PSA tens, that card. Um, and those are stonking pretty hard. Mm. So and, and how is it stonking hard? I think a lot of people want that card. Um, sure. Are people speculating in it? Uh, yeah who's not like 
If you're buying a multi-thousand dollar Mario Pikachu card, number one, you're a nerd. Number two, you know what you're buying. You know what I mean? (laughs) I'm not saying they look at the pop uh, account. They probably don't, actually, which is um, not not my style. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying, like, that's not my style. Yeah. Um, And uh, they they kind of probably instinctually understand that demand aspect, though, which is super important. It really is. That is a wild card. You nailed it. I'm looking at uh, TCG Fish for it. Um, and it's saying PSA 10 says 1,174. Um, and yeah, that, that thing is just like popping off right now. It's been popping off for a while, though. Like that that card first popped off in the like late, well, yeah, late 2020 boom. It went from like a couple hundred dollars of PSA 10 to multiple thousands. And then it just kind of had like a slow dip, but it never really crashed. It lost like 20%, 25 or 30% of the value. And then it just like, it's a, it's a fucking rocket ship right now. <laughs> Crazy. I want another rocket ship right now. Yeah, plus it's another like, rocket ship, man. I was too late for that card. Like when I got into the hobby in like late 2020, like that yeah. card already felt too expensive, you know? Oh man, yeah, that card boomed hard. Um it, it did that a couple of times, but you're right. Yeah, 2020 is really where it went off into what I would say is no man's land for mm. most people. It's just a beautiful card with a lot of demand. Yeah, it's cool. It's the, That's a great point. Seriously, I, uh, try to think of, well, you don't have to, like, I'm trying to think of some Pokemon cards that I would love to like have on my counter, like uh, in my nerd lounge, if you will. And like as a top, I'm not joking. Mario Pikachu comes to the top of my mind. Yeah. Uh, and cards. It's the kind of card that that you could show anyone who doesn't know anything about Pokemon or really care at all, and they're like, "Oh, that's cool. That's a Pikachu dressed up as Mario. I get it." You know, it's like so exactly. so relatable and taps into that entire other vein of nerd culture with Mario. So yeah, it's, it is. It's an amazing card. It's a great collaboration. I I wish I could have one, but uh, it's yeah. not not looking good for me. <laughs> that's okay. We, we might see a pullback. You never know. And then also, uh, with those cards in, in, in particular, let, I always like to exaggerate to make a point, again, to my small brain, which would be if they made, if there were 100,000 PSA 10 Mario Pikachu cards on the market right now, they'd be like $5. Of, uh, t- the cost that it would be to grade the card. That's where they would be sitting right now. Um so my never ending quest uh is digging into the data of finding like the sweet spot of like pop count number wise mm. and understanding that there there is like that importance there, but to what degree? Because again, the the knob that I I I don't know, I don't have any data on, which is that demand knob, right? Like I have no idea how far that sucker's gonna get cranked up yeah. on a particular card. Someone who's in tune, like new, like th- you could, you can see back, like I wasn't making videos, but like any content creator at the time, they were talking about Mario Pikachu cards and they're like, for sure, this is a really cool card. And like, you know, for potential speculation and stuff, like it might do really well. But again, if they made like, there are 20,000 of those, like the uh, Grand Prix Charizard card, uh, MPSA 10, like, yeah, that's too much. Currently, though, currently. Um, which is is interesting. So, for sure, man. Yeah, I think the Japanese so. promos were some of the like from the the Japanese market. That was kind of the first thing to gain traction, where people maybe weren't into Japanese sets and Japanese cards entirely, but the promos, these like cool collabs and limited releases and stuff like that, people figured that out around the time I was getting in. It seemed like the promo opportunities were gone. Like if you were buying cards like mario pikachu at release in 2016 you're like stocking up on the boxes opening some leaving them closed sealed doing whatever you, you made off like a bandit um they were like the first to hit that wave for sure yeah um <laughs> i say i agree too much but i agree <laughs> so. i also agree i agree that we both agree maybe too much uh, that made me feel like a like an anchorman moment like Sixty percent of the time, we agree every time. <laughs> but just for me, what would you say is a card? 
like a guilty pleasure card you would say that you're like i don't know why i really want this card but i kind of like want this card do you have something like that for mm. me and i think people are going to really judge me hard for it which is partly why i want to share is i don't have a psa 10 evolutions hollow charizard mm. and i want one for some reason <laughs> like, like i don't know why but I honestly do. I get that. I I think the most money I've ever lost on a single card that I bought early on was a PSA 9 Evolution Stars card. <laughs> I, I honestly, I think the PSA 10 of that card is cool, man. That, that thing is hard to find. So I don't blame you. I think that's a really good choice. Um, yeah, I, I love that. Oh, Thanks man. for defending me there. I, I didn't even have a good way to defend myself, but you're right. It's super, super hard to grade. And super. it's just modern enough to where most people know about it, I think. So I don't maybe that's why I want it. I don't know. I think it's a cool card. I love evolutions. That was that was evolutions what got me back in the hobby, but unlike a lot of people who got back into it in twenty sixteen when evolutions was a thing, that was the set in twenty twenty. I was like, I just need to open this. Um yeah because it was so nostalgic right so i so i paid a lot for a couple boxes of evolutions that i opened um i pulled the charizard it was extremely off center i just wanted like a nice copy of that charizard so i bought a psa 9 seemed like a nice sweet point this was when the tens were going for like six grand you know it was wild yeah. so i was like yeah the nine seems cheap i'll pick that up but it's still hundreds of dollars and now they're like 50 yeah. bucks or whatever to pick one up it's so ridiculous <laughs> But I got my nice, it's a nice copy of a cool card. It just happens to be worthless, you know? It's just, it is what it is. Hey, you didn't buy an Evolutions Booster box at the absolute peak like me, though, did you? <laughs> I did not, no. That was, yeah, that was a funny story, man. No, I, I actually did well, and I bought, for whatever reason, I was like, I want to open some Evolutions boxes, so I bought four when they were going for about 500 US, I think. Um, and like, they've never gone back to that price. They've got, they rocketed past and then they've gone down and they kind of stabilized somewhere in the middle of their peak and where I bought them at. And like, I've always been super happy with picking them up because got me back into the hobby. I love, I had an amazing time opening them. Um, it was just super, super fun. I streamed it and had a lot of like friends and family tune in. And it was just like, it was such a catalyzing moment. It's why I now like in the Pokemon hobby for sure was opening those sets. Um, so yeah, I, I had a great time with it, but I I did okay. I did badly. If I bought those boxes two months earlier, I would have paid like a hundred bucks. You know, like I hit it yep. as they were exploding like crazy, and everyone's like, "This is insane!" Like these box prices make no sense. Uh, but they continued way beyond that, so it, it worked out okay. Like if, if I was gonna buy them, I bought them at the best time that I could, basically. So sure. I do have that going for me. But you're you know the boxes are they're hanging in there. Like you'll get. You'll get them going again, you know. It's still, uh, I still think it's a great set. It, it's a weird one because it took way too long for that set to be properly appreciated. I think my, I'm super biased because it was the set that brought me back. But I think people forget when you're in the hobby and you see it everywhere and it's like mass produced and like you're just over it. It's really hard to forget all the people who haven't been exposed to it yet and who think this is like the greatest thing on earth, the experience of opening something that reminds them of their childhood. Um, that was worth a lot. That's why I paid what I did for the boxes. And so there's, it's just wild to me how long it took for that to kind of happen with that set in particular. But I, I get it now because I see other sets that are like all over the place. And I'm not that interested. And then they start to get a little harder to get and the prices are going up. And suddenly I'm I'm like, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should have bought more of those. Like, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, yeah. that's how it goes. That's okay. I don't blame you. Yeah. Man, you want to know a set that that surprised me performance wise? Yeah, what's that? The Japanese 25th anniversary booster boxes specifically. So I'm not talking like the promo packs. The promo packs and the cards in the promo packs I thought were always going to be cool. People are going to want those, but the core 25th set. I thought was such a stinker, you know, <laughs> and I thought the boxes were so cheap for a long time when people like resellers were selling them without the promo pack. So all you were getting was like the cards that were in celebrations that weren't um, 
Wow, what was the celebration special set called? What was the name for that? The uh, uh, like classic the... collection is that what they called it? Oh yes, I do, I do believe so. I'm actually you saying that. Uh, I don't know if people can still. Okay, yeah, you can still hear me. Yeah, I uh, someone just uh, made a comment that I replied to um, talking about like my opinion on uh, like the 151 UPC. But anyway, I specifically brought up the 25th, this nice. guy right here. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I bought it only to stonk with. I was like, I wasn't impressed with it. And I just looked earlier today. So that's why I was smiling when you brought this up. To go for $700 a box right now. Yeah, they're killing it. <laughs> I know. Well, here's my, I didn't get a golden box, but. This guy, this is my little secret gem. Oh, yeah. So, there it is. it's got a little golden box appeal. Right? But that is, they call that the special set. It comes with four booster packs and one promo pack in the box sealed. But it and the golden box are the only two Japanese products that had promo packs sealed within them so if the box is sealed then you know the packs weren't searched like they went in the box in the factory it was sealed and then distributed to you so i love those i bought a bunch of those um and they're also doing pretty well but what i didn't expect was that the booster boxes would do well because i thought no one's gonna want these booster boxes man like there's not a lot of great hits in it you've got full art professor oak which is a really cool card you got the golden mew which is a really cool card but other than that it's like you know the flying v max pikachu and stuff like it's all the the cards that we all pulled in celebrations and we're like they're just not that interesting or cool uh they're, they're great cards there's nothing wrong with them but they just don't carry the set and in japan the cards that carried the set of celebrations were isolated to the promo packs. So I thought those booster boxes were just going to, I thought they were going to be down and stay down. I don't think anyone would want them. Like, I don't know. I think they've like three or four X already um, from, from like their lows, which is crazy. Um, so that's just like a really interesting one. Like, I think I was, I was buying a lot of celebrations. I was like, it's just a better set, man. Like I like Japanese cards, but the promo pack system for those cards is not nearly as fun as just pulling them from the packs and celebrations. Uh, but I think the Japanese booster box has just done better anyways. Like I should have just bought the shittiest part of the Japanese 25th anniversary products and I would have been done. I would have done way better. <laughs> so. No to self. <laughs> like, I, I just thought of, uh, we can call a market shuffleism. Mm. So Supp supply demand in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, this was a great conversation with Gray from Pokemon Buyers Club today. Make sure you subscribe to his channel. The link will be in the description. We're going to try to potentially move this podcast to its own thing in the future, but go ahead and sub to him. He's a really cool dude sometimes. I can do the truffle shuffle, and you've been watching the market shuffle. Hey, that worked! <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I was totally off the cuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. It's gold. Gold, Jerry. <laughs>